Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Dave Judas and I'm the head of intermediary sales and national accounts at Barron Capital. Today we're lucky to be joined by Cliff Greenberg, co-CIO and portfolio manager since the Barron Small Cap Fund's inception in 1997. Hey Cliff. And hey, also hey, and uh, David Goldsmith who's worked with Cliff on the fund since joining Barron over 17 years ago. Hey David. Hi everyone. We'll be discussing the Barron Small Cap Fund and the Opportunistic Small Cap Strategy. But before we start, we're going to congratulate Cliff and David on the impressive long-term results that we see on the first slide. It delivered over 390 basis points of annualized excess returns over the Russell 2000 Growth Index since inception in 1997. With a 10-year beta of 0 0.91, a 9386 upside-downside capture ratio, and very strong results over the last three and five year period as well. So congratulations, guys. On the next slide, you can also see the Barron Small Cap Funds outperformed its benchmark 64% of the time on a rolling five year basis since inception. And what's really notable is the percentage rises to 100% over those periods where the market declined. So again, very impressive long-term results outperforming Morningstar peers about 92% of the time on rolling five-year periods since inception. So we're gonna kick it off. If you have any questions during the course of our webinar today, please type them in to your Zoom control panel or send them to questions at barronfunds.com. We'll do our best to address them or we'll get someone from Barron to follow up with you. Let me start off with David. Can you please give us an overview of performance in the last quarter? Sure, David, I'm happy to. So the Barron Small Cap Fund was up 4% in the fourth quarter, roughly in line with the Russell 2000 Growth Index, which we use as our benchmark. Our stock selection was strong, um, offset by our allocation effect. That's mostly a lack of energy, which was 7% of the index, and that was up 17%. Consumer staples, uh, also we uh, lack exposure, that was up 11%, was a little bit of a drag. Healthcare was our standout. We uh, added 250 basis points relative to our performance. That comprises 14% of our fund and our, and our stocks were up 10% in the quarter versus negative 3% for the index. Some of those names are familiar to, to some of you who own the fund. Dexcom, uh, the diabetes management pioneer, uh, was up, uh, 40, you know, was up um, 40% and Inspire Medical also up 40%. That's a sleep apnea device manufacturer. Uh, Inspire revenues were up 77% the quarter, pretty impressive. Other names that I added were Mettler, Toledo, and IDEX. Uh, IT and consumer discretionary together are 36% of the fund, and those sectors were each up over 5% in the quarter. Uh, Gartner does syndicated research, our largest position, and that name we've owned for 15 years and was up 21% in the quarter. Uh, they post great results up 15%, higher margins, and the stellar balance sheet enabled them to, to repurchase a billion dollars uh, year to date in stock. On the consumer side, another contributor was Planet Fitness. That's the low cost gym operator. They uh, emerged out of COVID stronger than ever with some of the low cost other gyms going out of business. Their membership is at all time highs and their units are progressively back on track to double the footprint over the, over the next coming years. Industrials is 26% of the fund and was up 3% absolute, but was still a drag, 75 relative. Vertiv um, was a big contributor in industrials. It's a power and heating and cooling company that um, had its issues earlier in the year, but have overcome that with pricing to offset cost increases. And they posted great results, improved margins, and one of few of our companies to have visibility into 23 and provide a positive outlook. That stock was up 40% in the quarter. Chart Industries is a process and technology equipment manufacturer for uh, clean energy markets. That stock was down 37% after announcing a large deal that we'll talk more in detail about later. But that was one of our biggest detractors, as you can see from this slide. Other detractors, Grid Dynamics was down just, uh, I think, on tech sentiment, where the company's growth slowed marginally. Uh, we think that company is poised to grow for a long period of time, 15 to 20%, and can triple its revenues over the, that time period. European Wax, also a small detractor, 
Um, that, again, was more on consumer sentiment declining and the outlook for maybe a little bit of retrenchment from the consumer. They saw it marginally in their business. We think it, the out-of-home wax is a needed service, recession resistant, and the economics of the franchise business and the model is, is, um, is one of the best in retail. We still strongly believe in that stock and added to it uh, in the quarter. On assignment also is, is, is best positions as it's ever, yet uh, the stock went down after posting good results on fears of unemployment um, impacting their business. Um, something we saw throughout the quarter that I want to touch on is our larger cap names continue to outperform our smaller cap names. Market caps greater than $10 billion, those stocks were up 10%. Market caps with less than $2 billion were down 9%. So um, that rounds out the Q4 performance. And before we bury these files deep in the annals, <laughs> let me turn it to Cliff to give a little more perspective on the year. Um, well, uh, as we all know, that last year was a, a, a very tough year for uh, investing in general, for small cap growth investing, and for the Barron Small Cap Fund. Our fund was down 31% for the year. The index David referred to was down 26.5%. Um, it was the worst year for the fund and for um, the markets in 15 years. To um, generally recount, and we've gone, we've uh, lived, we've all lived through this over the last year, the causes of the uh, down significant downdraft in the economy this and the markets this last year was uh, inflation, which was much higher than expected. The Federal Reserve um, uh, raised interest rates dramatically, increasing rates seven times, some of, some of the rate increases being 75 basis points, um, and was very strident in their um, approach and in their words to, to uh, tame and um, rid the economy of inflation. Um, interest rates, the 10-year started at the year, the year at 1.5% and climbed to over 4% at some point, ending at 3.8%. And the higher interest rates um, and the lower stock market asset values um, led to the um, slowing of the economy, which we started to feel um, in the back half of last year, and we expect to continue um, into the beginning of, of the upcoming year. Um, growth stocks got hammered last year. Primarily, um, it was multiple contraction. Stocks started at uh, pretty healthy valuations um, with the expectations that earnings would um, be strong and continue to grow on at a strong pace. A uh, combination of higher interest rates hurt multiples and then lower earnings, um, projections for lower earnings, especially in, in the year we're in now, uh, that was a double whammy and took um, growth stocks down very, very hard. Um, actually, when we look at the results of our companies, most of our businesses did pretty well in, t in um, 23, uh, excuse me, in 22. We are expecting slower growth go forward, but the issue really wasn't so much um, how companies performed, but it was um, maybe their stocks were, were um, too highly priced or there was concern about future issues with performance. Um, most all of the stocks in our fund got, got hit, except if the business had a really exceptional performance, like Gartner that David just mentioned was flat in a year and had a, a, you know, a, a stellar, stellar year of business performance. Um, but some of our stocks were hit even harder in our fund. And as we look at it, we kind of bucket them into three different groups. One being companies that are um, considered to be sensitive to higher interest rates or negatively affected by higher interest rates. Um, I mean by those um, Site One, IBP, Floor and Decor, and Trex, which are businesses that really are involved somewhat in housing. And the thought was if housing slows, these businesses um, would be negatively affected, which is the case. But still, those stocks were down 50%, which is overkill, as we'll explain later in this in this. A uh, little talk. Um, the second group of stocks that was were um, hit um, uh, extremely hard were those that were providing uh, technology or employment services. Again, tech spending kind of slowed later in the year. Um, there's concern that the economy um, unemployment will pick up, and therefore companies involved in uh, providing employment services 
We're also uh, poor performers, again, down 35 to 50%, many of these stocks, even if they reported good results. Um, and then we did have a handful of stocks that missed numbers. Those stocks got punished as often is the case when, co when companies miss numbers. Very often the, the misses though had to do with lingering supply chain issues from the COVID period, which are kind of behind the companies. And most of the businesses that, that stumbled during the year are actually back on a good path and um, we feel very comfortable with. So um, it was a tough year. It happened very fast. You know, er, the, the losses that we suffered were all in the first half. The third quarter, we were down a little. The fourth quarter, we were up a little. But, you know, the, the declines in the fund and in the market were in the first half of the year. Um, and, you know, but unfortunately, the concerns of the first half of the year, which were inflation might be harder to deal with and rates might need to go higher than expected, which could negatively affect the future growth rates of the economy, really has played out. Um, and therefore, we're walking into an environment now where business will be slower um, than we would have hoped or would have underwritten at the beginning of last year. So in any case, uh, you know, I'm, as David just mentioned, it's good to have that year behind us. It was very, very trying for, uh, you know, for all investors. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Um, sure. Maybe, David, we could talk about new buys or sells in the portfolio. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And um, as you can see from, from the slide, uh, I'll talk on Neogen, which is a new ad uh, in the quarter, but one that we're very, Cliff and I are very familiar with because um, it, uh, it's a name we've owned in the past. So um, it's uh, Neogen is a pure play food and security company focused on animal and food safety. Think of equipment like diagnostic tests test to for unintended um, substances in food, uh, indicator tests, dis disinfectants, rodenticides, lab services, anything that touches food security from uh, gate to plate. And this is a company that is a market leader that uh, you know, we've known for, for many years and, and very fond of the business model. We re-engaged in the stock and the company when they announced a merger with 3M Food Safety. So they are buying a bit, you know, this is a transformative, transformative deal that's gonna take Neogen to the next level, um, take them to different areas, and there's a lot of opportunity from the combined businesses. So we're really behind the acquisition. 3M in its own right is a great business, historically growing 9% uh, on a sales CAGR with 30% EBITDA margins, yet was only 1% of 3M sales and with more focus from Neogen and some capital put into the business, we think uh, that business can accelerate growth and achieve even higher margins. For example, its indicator testing line, it's, which is 50% of revenues, shared a plant with other 3M products and was starved for supply and capital and couldn't meet up with demand. So um, again, and then the other aspect of us coming back to the stock was the valuation. Uh, due to the merger, there were some technical issues with a technical selling from 3M shareholders who got stock in the deal. And we were able to buy a great business at a very attractive price that we think uh, can grow many fold over, over the coming years. Yeah, because this, I mean, when this transaction was announced, the agent stock was trading in the 40s. It fell at bottom to almost $10 a share yeah. over confusion about what the new company was going to be and also a near-term slowdown in the acquired business mm -hmm. that, that uh, Neogen was buying, which just sent the, the stock uh, plummeting and, and uh, created a great entry point for us. Right. And so Neogen, when you look at it, checks all our boxes. It's a market leader in a growing uh, secular trend. Food security is only getting better with regulatory focus and consumers wanting to know what's in their products. There's a global business, emerging markets that need more proteins, need more testing, need more equipment. Uh, Neogen fills that need. And we are is a, you know, a, a company that has a proven track record. Six quarters out of the last 32 years, it's failed to grow. It's an amazing growth company, well managed, and the model pres uh, you know, provides high free cash flow that they're able to quickly delever from the, the capital needed for the deal and layer on more acquisitions as they've done in the past. So, really think this one's a, a great holding for our firm and our, our, our fund. The other name I want to touch on is Chart Industries, a name we bought earlier in the year, uh, had success in the, in the market, and uh, made an acquisition in the fourth quarter, a $4.4 billion deal of Howden, a uh, gas and compressor company. 
it's actually a complementary business to what Chart does, which is cryogenic uh, equipment processing for the clean energy market. So they're kind of doubling down on that space. But uh, the deal was announced uh, surprisingly without uh, uh, you know, financing in place, and the market absolutely hated it. Sent the stock down 36% that day. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it in my 16 years. Um, we double down the work that we've done on chart in the industry, and we actually are supportive of, of the acquisition. We think it adds uh, geographic diversity, aftermarket services, uh, Howden's a great business in its own right, transformed over the last two years under private ownership, which the public markets didn't see. And so we, um, we, we thought that was a, a good deal that was, was misrepresented by the stock price. The company uh, ameliorated its, you know, it, or got financing in place through a debt and equity offering in December, which we participated in at depressed prices. And uh, we really do feel the combination is one that one plus one equals three. This is a better business coming out of this as they delever, which they've mentioned multiple, many opportunities to do so. Higher margin can add 500 basis points to the total margin, generate a lot of free cash. And this will pro profile as a best in class industrial business targeting a growing sector, sector of the economy for decarbonization, carbon capture, hydrogen, LNG gas. So um, again, that's a name that we invested in and doubled down as the stock went down and the transit that we understood the transaction a little better and the financing was in place. Again, so the market's being very, very volatile. Stocks have huge swings, which it, we can take advantage of, especially or when we have a varying view on uh, what's happening at that moment in time, very often is a, a great time for us to uh, buy a new position or sometimes sell it out of something that we presently own. As David mentioned, this stock fell from 200 to 120. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought, we owned a half percent position going into that decline, increased the position to 2% or you know, significantly increased in the position when they raised additional capital. And what's your, do we have a $250, $300 kind of near-term stock target? To think that Using more conservative estimates and a lower multiple, even though we do believe that there's multiple you know, expansion possible. So we made this a big position and, and uh, are very excited about its prospects. Yeah, and just quickly touching on um, some other purchases I mentioned, European Wax and Grid were detractors in the quarter, but we think the businesses are solid and, and have a great bright future. And some sales, I would just call out Gartner and Dexcom, which is our practice to trim higher, higher market cap, uh, trim the positions of higher market cap companies uh, to fund small, smaller cap purchases. Great. Maybe we can dive a little bit more into portfolio construction. Cliff, we've, we've gotten questions about the recent volatility, whether you guys are seeing more opportunities and getting more active and making more buys, adding names. Um, maybe you want to comment on that? Sure. If we can, just we, we ended it. Thanks, Dave. Um, and, and an interesting question. We ended, we ended the quarter with about $4 billion under management. Um, 66 names in a portfolio and 32.6% in the top 10 holdings. If any of you all are uh, long-term shareholders, and thank you if you are, mm -hmm. uh, many of the names in this in the list are, are probably very familiar to you, and we've, we've owned uh, many of them for a long period of time. Um, but this year, we actually reduced the amount of stocks that we held and increased the concentration of the fund. Um, and that's kind of counterintuitive. With so many stocks falling and so many businesses kind of on sale, why wouldn't we be anxious to um, uh, buy new stocks and, and add to our portfolio? Well, actually how we operate in periods of stress and when you know, economies are tough and the markets are tough is we prefer to kind of um, have larger p positions and stay and have bigger investments in the names that we're actually most comfortable in, companies that we've had long experience with, have a very strong view about their future success. And when their stocks go down, um, we're more anxious or more interested in kind of having those be more significant to the portfolio than needing to go find something else that's, that's new to the fund. So on occasion, was. Dave mentioned, we'll find what we think is a great idea, like a neogen or chart. But honestly, what we did during this year 
was we kind of trimmed some of our smaller positions that when we looked ourselves in the mirror, we were less confident in or less excited about or thought were a little too risky to, in tough periods of time. And so the portfolio came out to be a little tighter and a little more concentrated, which um, is how we've operated in the past during uh, periods of stress like this. Great. Thank you, Cliff. Sure. Um, looking at um, small caps overall, maybe David, you know, we got the question, is now a favorable time to invest in small caps? And I know, I know you, you guys have a lot of thoughts on that. Maybe you could take a few minutes here and just uh, give us your thoughts on why now might be favorable. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, the Russell 2000 growth had its third biggest decline ever. And given that valuations for small cap stocks uh, historically versus their own you know, relative are at low, you know, some of its lowest levels as can be seen by the, the chart here. Uh, small caps are typically four, are typically 7% of the global, of the, the U.S. market cap, they're four to 5%. So this, um, this slide and the next slide are just really mean reversion, uh, you know, opportunities for mean reversion, which you happen to see. 2022, small caps declined the most and earliest, and they're actually starting to pick up a little bit. Um, small caps should benefit from M&A and CapEx cycles in the U.S., either that's government stimulus, uh, the IRA. Um, they're more attuned to that. And then when you look at small caps versus large caps, historically trading at a premium over the last 20 plus years, they're actually trading at a discount. And um, that's very unlikely. So, uh, you know, our, the thesis is that small caps are cheap relatively and versus themselves historically. Um, but there's caution to that because this is at a price earnings ratio you're looking at this. There is still 25% of small cap stocks don't make money. And so when the companies we gravitate toward, towards do and have you know, strong pre capital profiles. If you look at a chart on that with, through that lens, small caps are even cheaper uh, than large caps and really an opportune time to take great businesses at very reasonable valuations, especially versus large cap. And, and I think uh, Leon Cooperman said it on CNBC that this is a market of stocks, not a stock market. So, and that's what we're trying to do with our 70 names and you know, 20 on the idealist is find those businesses that are uh, reasonably valued that have good growth potential. So, um, you know, kick it to Cliff on, on maybe discussion on that. Yeah, let me, let me take over from there, Dave. So I agree that small caps um, as, a, as an asset class are uh, cheap now relative to where they have been in, in, in the past. Um, we're even more focused on, you know, how the valuations of our particular companies. And I believe, I believe in what David just said, that um, we're, not, we're not investing in an asset class. We're investing in, in particular um, equities, um, businesses that we know very, very well. We're in constant communication with, um, have strong views about how they're um, going to, how they're doing now, how we expect them to do near term, and especially how we hope they um, and expect them to grow over the long period of time. So most of my, when we talk about or when you hear about uh, valuations on CNBC, most market commentators talk about the valuation of indexes and that earnings estimates need to come down and the multiple of those stocks versus historically where those indexes traded. And um, we're much more granular than that and focused on um, what we uh, are underwriting and expectations for the companies that we own and how those stocks are valued um, in our portfolio at this moment. Um, so we do, you know, we're in constant contact with our, business, our companies and in, you know, have a very deep research team that's understanding industries and, and speaking to competitors and, and understands the uh, economic environment very well, if in, in my sentiment, in my opinion. Um, and therefore, uh, when we, as we look at our prospects for our businesses this year and next, growth is definitely slower than we would have expected going into the last year because of the macro. Um, on the other hand, we expect maybe 10% of the stocks that we own to have earnings that will be uh, flat or down this year, where uh, most um, uh, for the broader indexes like the S&P 500, um, most estimates for, for maybe a third of the companies in those indexes to actually have uh, down earnings this year. 
Um, so we expect our businesses to kind of do better than most because of how special they are and their um, competitive position in their particular modes. Um, but let me let me flip to this slide. This is kind of the money slide. What I wanted to uh, show off on, on, you know, as as we speak today. Um, uh, this shy slide shows um, the value, the top ten holdings of the fund, and the present valuations of those companies based on our estimates, which again are based on our real time work and conversations with businesses and others. Um, uh, for this year and next year, not, not even over a long period of time. And um, uh, my takeaway from this chart is that um, seven of the 10 companies listed are trading at multiples that I believe are significantly lower than where these charts, these stocks will trade on a, uh, you know, on a should trade and will trade on a go forward basis. Um, even if interest rates are to rise, um, you know, I, I still believe, and, and multiples will, are not as extended as maybe they were during the last few years when rates were, were close to zero. Um, as I look at this chart, on assignment is this fabulous uh, growth um, employment business trading at 10 times next year's earnings. It deserves to trade at 15 or 20 times. Icon PLC is the leading CRO company made, just made a great, great acquisition. Uh, it's trading at 14 times next year's earnings and, and in our mind should be trading at 20 times next year's earnings. Uh, Red Rocks and installed business products are leading businesses and one's a casino operator and one's an installer of, of uh, building products. Um, businesses that have, you know, very special and have great growth Trade, each trading at seven times next year's EBITDA, and in our mind are worth 10 to 12 times, if not more, as a multiple of sales. And some of our high growth businesses, Floor and Decor, um, trades 20 times next year, and Site One trades 13 times next year's EBITDA. If you could see, we're using different metrics, which are the most appropriate for those particular companies. Those are very, very cheap multiples for companies that we believe will com compound their earnings at 25 plus percent a year and each can grow their uh, profitability four or five times over the, you know, over the next five or 10 years. So um, it's the point I'd like to make is it's uh, very unusual that we can um, capture a moment in time in which the multiples are so understated and therefore when we look at the potential returns of the fund, um, the returns um, are, are, are higher than they usually, or the potential returns are higher than usual because we do believe that the companies are gonna start to grow and grow and get back to their uh, pre last year or so uh, growth rates. But importantly, we're gonna, we expect to have significant multiple expansion um, as these companies um, do grow again and the market starts looking forward as opposed to looking downwards or looking backwards. Um, and therefore that multiple expansion we expect will drive, um, you know, very significant um, additional performance uh, for the fund on a go forward basis from this, from this point. So that's great. Um, certainly cool. compelling case you guys make investing in small caps, uh, at, you know, at this time. So I appreciate that. Um, maybe to continue with, you know, Cliff, you're just alluding to some, some go forward thoughts. You know, the, the, the market in the fund is certainly off to a good start this year. Um, maybe you want to talk about why that is and what's your outlook for the rest of the year? Sure. Um, well, my take and, you know, and, and you're right, the market is, it's kind of surprising because we came into this year with uh, extreme pessimism and terrible performance last year from most, most stocks and a lot of negativity. Yet, um, you know, our fund is up over, is up double digits and the markets and, uh, is acting very well this year. Uh, to me, it's a, a, a three factors that are driving a better than expected market performance in addition to that sentiment that was so negative when, and when that flips or that, that sets up for good performance. Um, the, the economy is actually pretty healthy. Uh, consumer spending is, is solid. Employment remains very strong. And though we believe things will slow down, um, we don't see the economy falling off a cliff, which is one of the real negative 
um, concerns or, or tenants to the bear case. Uh, inflation is declining, and the, you know the CPI has um, uh, the reported CPI is down six months in a row. And if you look carefully at what's happening behind the scenes, you know inflation feels like it's falling uh, much faster and much more significantly than we than we um, had expected. And so um, maybe that means that the Fed doesn't need to continue to um, raise inf interest rates um, uh, so much more or keep interest rates high for such a long period of time. And that, that's the other point that is kind of driving the market is the, the stock market now does believe, even if the Fed is talking tough um, and you know, that rates will uh, be higher and stay higher, that rates will kind of uh, crest and we're close to the end of, of the interest rate hiking cycle and lower interest rates um, will help the economy um, pick back up and uh, help stock multiples. So, um, you know, for a, a few reasons, um, the market is kind of acting a lot better than people suspected. Now, you know, the, the bear case from here, what most people are concerned about is again, rates will stay high, the economy will be soft, corporate earnings um, will be troubled, and stocks will just wallow through the morass of, of fighting through that for another year or, or for a, a period of time. Um, the bull case is um, that uh, in essence that we're, you know, that the economy will do okay and earnings won't be so bad. Um, and that rates will stop going up um, and we'll stop, we'll start looking to the future and valuing companies at what we think are appropriate multiples to what they're presently earning. And importantly, starting to um, take into account the quality of businesses and the future growth prospects of companies in the future, especially our high quality businesses and start valuing businesses off not what they're going to earn, what they earned last year or what, you know, they're going to earn during the battle we're in right now, but what what they're going to earn out in the future. And, you know, in our work, as I tried to uh, point out before, is that stocks are um, uh, cheap um, on our, our estimates on what companies we expect companies to earn this year and next. And honestly, we expect the companies to earn and our, our profile and our investment approach is to look long term, not just this year and next. And so when we try to look at our stocks against um, what we believe they're going to earn five years from now, well, we think we're set up to make very, very uh, big returns uh, from these levels. And it's going to be a fight on, you know, does that, is that just begun and we're started on that uptrend? Or are we going to have a, you know, a battle of higher rates and lower earnings this year and people are going to, um, you know, and, and the uptrend won't start till later this year or next year. And that's the point where I don't believe we really have a you know, a very strong opinion. I don't think anyone really does have a, a strong opinion. Um, but we do believe that, uh, you know, we've gone through the worst of it, the suffering of the reset that took place next last year. And, you know, from here we have, uh, you know, in time we'll, we'll make, you know, uh, stocks will be much higher and the, and the fund will do really well. So that's, right. that's kind of our, our thinking. No, cool. that's helpful. Thank you. And just looking at the question that came in about Gartner, uh, maybe you could share a little bit about medium long-term outlook, but also what's the competitive advantage in, in our view? Sure. Competitive advantage, Gartner, we've owned for 16 years, 17 years. 17 years. years. Right. Um, <laughs> they are the gold standard in syndicated research companies. This is another play on digital transformation. Companies are relying on Gartner and their analysts and advice to help them make that transition. And Gartner has done a great job of not only doing that in uh, technology, but now other verticals as well. And a business they grew, they bought a couple of years ago is showing the same hallmarks of the legacy research business, the, the CEB business that they bought. That company, we really believe, can do $20 of free cash flow and should trade, like we showed on the chart, at 25 times, which is the fair value for this business. And that gets us to a $500 stock price in a couple of years, uh, and historically they've grown 20 to 25 percent on on the free cash flow per share, which is the right metric, and we see that continuing. Right, Gartner, as Dave mentioned, is our largest stock. It's been an amazing investment. 
we bought into the company. I'm just looking at kind of historical sheets with a, when the company had a market capitalization of uh, two billion dollars, 2.2 billion 15 years ago. The present market cap of the company is 26 billion dollars. We've made over 15 times our money on that in, on the investment. And as David mentioned, it's a sensational business that we think we can continue to make very good compounded rates of return as it's um, top line organic growth is uh, a double digit, mid double digit now with the success of CE, the turnaround in CEB. Uh, margins will um, continue to go higher from here. The company generates uh, incredible amounts of free cash flow that they're usually aggressive in buying their shares back, which adds to equity returns. And therefore, we continue to believe that free cash flow per share can grow at 20 plus percent on a go forward basis. Stocks trading at a fair value now of 20 times next year's free cash flow, but we expect to make that that uh, compounding can continue and it can be a fabulous, you know, continue to be a really uh, strong stock even even after the great returns we've made uh, in owning that stock so far. We talk sometimes, and this is the crowning uh, jewel in you know in this analysis that you know when we can find these very special businesses, unique great growth, great business characteristics. Um, sometimes they can grow faster and longer and better than we ever underwrit. I, if you asked me 15 years ago, could Gartner be a $26 billion entity? And could we have, you know, could it have compounded at this rate for this long a period of time? Um, I would not have, uh, you know, I would have signed up uh, for that, or I would not have expected that that necessarily is the case, but the real good ones that you find, um, you know, really can, outperform even your your wildest dreams and, and a big part of the uh, strong returns that we've made in the fund over over the years is putting our fingers on and finding a lot of uh, these kind of companies that that succeed for a long period of time and that we can and our shareholders we all can uh, make um, great compounded returns um, as the companies succeed um, hopefully as david mentioned neogen and chart are you know, will be our, our next new examples and, and, you know, be for the fun in time what Gartner has been over time. So. Great. Thank cool. you, guys. We have one other, uh, quick question. Um, if any SPAC purchases remain in the portfolio and might there be some disruptive opportunities there like Velo 3B? I'm sorry, any SPAC? Is that what you mentioned? Right. Any Remnants yeah. of any yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I you know, the SPAC, um, for our some of our investors who have been with us for a while, uh, we were uh, um, very opportunistic in buying into SPACs, especially in 19 and maybe early 20, when um, a new generation or approach to SPAC investing um, uh, grew up. And very fine companies were being rolled into, were being taken public through mergers into SPACs. Um, and many of those uh, uh, companies, you know, were great, great stocks for a while. But then too many SPACs got um, issued and the SPACs uh, went out and started uh, investing in very speculative businesses, many of which uh, did not perform as public companies and combination of uh, the disappointment over that and just the lack of understanding of what the SPACs were very often bad balance sheets and, and you know, uh, complicated issue, issues or stock for sale from the, the promoters um, caused most of the asset class to just get wrecked over the last year or two. And um, companies that we still have a handful of companies that came public through SPAC mergers Many of those companies, you know, are, are three to four or five years into being public now. Meridian was one we just mentioned. Right. We're very positive. Right. Us so, brand, um, right. another you know, consumer staple business that isn't wasn't a high flying company came through that channel that we are big investors in as well. Right. So there's this, we still own a, a bunch of some of I think we made twelve investments. There's probably four or five that are still in the fund. Mm -hmm. um, Many of those, you know, it's a long time since they were a SPAC. On the other hand, they're still tainted to some degree because they came public through that approach. Doesn't make quite make sense. And um, but the, we we note that the valuation of some of our SPAC holdings are lower than the valuations of companies that came public 
through regular way IPOs or just for public for many, many years. So um, we look at them as just any other investment. And as David mentioned, Vertum is a you know company that um, you know is a leader in its sector and um, was a good stock this last year, recovering from. Uh, they had a, a, a bad stub of toe earlier in the year, but um, it's something that we believe strongly in. And, you know, we, we still have uh, holdings in Clarivate, which has a new shareholder, um, you know, new leadership, and, and believe that's a very fine company at a very cheap valuation. So, um, and, and, the, and the question of finding diamonds in the rough, we still have all these on our screens, did a lot of the legwork prior, and are monitoring those for opportunities to re-engage. Below 3D is, a, and as the, the name you mentioned, is owned across in some portfolios in the shop. We actually have, a, I know, the call on my calendar on Friday. So yes, we are aware of that one and uh, plan to do more work on that and many of the others. Yeah, I, I sense there's still, there's a lot of opportunity in those kind of busted out SPACs. Um, not so sure we'll make significant investments for Barron Small Cap Fund because at a $4 billion asset base, I'm not so sure there's enough um, liquidity in those names for us to have significant enough positions, especially in a moment of time right now where we're, you know, we, we prefer to stick with our, the ones that we really have great, great confidence in and long-term success in, as I tried to explain before. Got it. Got cool. it. Guys, thanks. Much appreciate your optimism. Go forward and from an evaluation perspective and the potential of the companies and portfolio. It sounds like it's going to be an exciting time for Barron Small Cap Fund. So um, that, that concludes our discussion for today. I wanted to thank you guys again and encourage folks to visit our website, www.barronfunds.com, for replay information on this as well as our other PM webinars that are taking place. And uh, thank you again for joining today and thank you uh, for investing with us. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, everyone. Thanks,